Excellent, Scott. It's like little magic behind the scenes there. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, we're now on to our next uh, speakers. Um, and um, shall I pop your slides up for you, Debbie and uh, David? There we go. And then that would be fabulous. Thank you. Pass over the baton, and um, you now have the ship. Great. Okay. There you go. On to you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is really um, an alt special because it's mainly alt people that have contributed to this institutional compassion work we've been doing over the last three years. So we've interviewed lots of people and we've done a survey and this is kind of a, a model coming out of it, I guess. So um, we're looking forward to sharing it with you. David, do you want to start and say a little more? Uh, yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's David Biggins. Uh, I've been working with uh, Debbie for the last uh, four years on, on this area. Uh, we're excited to present uh, what we've been finding uh, to you today, all about digital well-being in particular. So yeah, really happy to be here uh, presenting to you. So we really think that digital well-being is quite a contested area. If you look at images of digital well-being, you tend to get kind of drippy mid-30s women with cups of coffee. And if we think about the keynote this morning, they're all white if we look at the images for the apps and things on digital well-being. And everybody's kind of happy and you just have to go over there to be fixed. And we really want to kind of challenge that today in our talk and to say that's really not enough. It's just for institutions to offer you know go over here and have a look at some websites and apps and you're going to be fine with your mental health and your well-being and so on and so on so um We've got a lovely disc, disc definition about digital well-being and how to define it. And obviously, we know that digital technologies present many opportunities for new ways of working. Look at us all at this wonderful summit. Um, but we need to think about the positive benefits, but also negative benefit, negative aspects. Thinking about the learners, but also our staff who are delivering all of this and delivering it very fast with the current pandemic. So we've got an audience feedback thing in the chat. How much of an issue do you think staff and student well-being is in your institution? Do you think you've got it completely nailed? Have you got wonderful policies? Is there lots for staff and nothing for students? Massive, larger than we know about. Mm, thank you. Oh, that's really great, Ross, getting better. Yeah, that's good to see you. Yeah, ignored. Yeah, quite a lot of our research aid showed ignored. More awareness. Yeah, lots and lots of staff. Yeah. Ah, well, that's great, Deb. Obscure, vocal. Hmm. OK, that's really, really helpful. Do keep on putting the things in the chat and we'll do a little summary sort of later on. Um, so let's just move on then. So, David, we started, didn't we, a couple of years back, looking at the toolkit. We did. We recognised that at our institution, uh, there were very many tools in use, uh, but they weren't really very well organised. So some staff knew about them, some didn't, some used them really well, some were very embryonic in their use. So we created uh, this composite called the TEL Toolkit, where we brought all these tools together in one place with guidance for staff in terms of how they could use them to really standardise practice with using TEL tools for our staff. I think that very strongly to the pedagogic use of those tools. So it was much more than just the tools themselves, but there was evidence for the use uh, and application of those tools in different learning environments. So that's four years ago we started that, and that's continued um, for the last four years. And because of that, we started every night to look at this ontology of how toolkits are used, who's using them, how they develop them, and that's the basis of what we've been talking about in today's presentation uh, about the model that's come out of that uh, that work. So in terms of uh, thinking about the implementation of, of digital skills and technology within institutions, uh, this report, again, from, from JISC and, and USISA, a look at some of the uh, barriers to success. And top of that is this thing like culture, finance, 
capability, the problem of legacy systems and how that ties us in terms of what we can do and how we can do it. And also leadership in terms of um, organizational leadership in terms of bringing these new uh, ways of working into our institutions. Uh, so next question for you on our next slide. We move on to the next one is in terms of your uh, digital success going forward what type of barriers beyond that we've just seen do you see or are some of those uh, resonating with you in terms of problems in your own institution in terms of bringing these things um, into the classroom virtual or, or not So I think that the, the USIZER study covers many of the, the areas. Uh, so I'd be interested to know if there are any more that you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the TEF uh, should probably be in there as well as a, an external measure of how well we're doing things. Mm -hmm. um, setting metrics and measures for, for our various mm -hmm. uh, ways of, of working, so that certainly should be there. And Edel's mentioning here um, the problem of, of staff burnout. Uh, Debbie mentioned a while ago that staff are really uh, quite hard pressed at the moment to scale up their, their teaching to deliver all online. So there's certainly an increased pressure on staff at the moment, which is again a barrier to innovation and development. Um, because if people have a hard time coping with their current workload, it's difficult to think about new ways of, uh, of doing things. Yeah, I like Ross's wi -Fi. point about Wi-Fi. Certainly mm. in rural Dorset, we've got a lot of students that live in rural Dorset. They just don't have robust Wi-Fi and it's really, really difficult. Yeah, and then Rich is a really good one, Zoom fatigue. Mm. Consistency of approach versus agency. Yeah, mm. we're moving online so fast, Louise, that some of the pedagogy sometimes can get, get missed. Mm. Ah, I like yes. to point about consistency as well, that we do mm. often change from initiative to initiative in a very short period of time and don't allow any of those to see them out to fruition, uh, which is a real frustration mm. for many, uh, many people in many mm. places. OK, let's uh, let's move on then. Thank you ever so much. No, no, thank you. Uh, so the European Union some time ago started looking at uh, citizens' digital competency. Uh, this was backed up by the fact that I think in nine, 2018, uh, the World Economic Forum suggested that while 75 million jobs would be displaced by digital technology, 138 million uh, would be created. So there's a, a great need to identify across, across Europe people's digital uh, skills. And this model was created with these five different areas. Uh, so communication collaborations is what we're doing now through things like Zoom, uh, content creation, Safety here encompasses things like uh, physical safety, but also privacy and well-being is part, part of that. And problem solving, I always think it's an odd term here, but it's about problem solving in the digital environment. So it's all about how we innovate digitally or how we evolve digitally or how we problem solve in a digital environment. And then general information and, uh, and data literacy. From this uh, model, uh, the EU developed uh, four levels of proficiency uh, for people from foundation uh, through intermediate, uh, advanced, up to um, highly specialised. And that links quite closely to uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, so the foundation level being like remembering and highly specialised is all about the creativity. Uh, so that was one model. Uh, that you may well know. Uh, the next model, I think you definitely will know, obviously is the, the, sorry, the, uh, uh, the GISC digital capability model, uh, which really looks at this aspect from a teaching and learning uh, perspective, which is, which is really useful. I'm not going to spend much time on that because we all know that uh, very well. Um, and last year, uh, GISC started to broaden out this perspective to look at an organisational framework uh, for, for digital learning which is very much uh, where we've come to a similar place over the last couple of years uh, as well. So here we're looking at uh, how we can look at content, uh, the culture of organisations, um, how um, ICT itself, the infrastructure that we have, uh, is so important. And this links back to some of the constraints we had before in terms of barriers to implementing success within organisations. 
So, so based on our research and these, these useful models, uh, we started to look at, from an organizational perspective, some of the key areas um, that we wanted to explore, we thought were important uh, in this. And we came up with these key areas of the institution, capability, and then well-being and lifelong learning. And within those, we started to uh, drill down into the, the key elements or aspects of, of those. So within the institution, uh, we, we thought it was really important how the institutional st strategy uh, looks at digital learning and to what extent digital learning informs the institutional strategy as a key measure. Secondly, as we've talked about already this, this morning, organisational culture is really important uh, that institutions have a, a culture which supports innovation, trying things out, doesn't penalise people if things don't go well, and that staff feel able and have the time, uh, and thinking back to the point earlier, have the capacity uh, to innovate and try out things that are, are new. And then there's technical infrastructure. So this is back to the ICT, uh, nuts and bolts of organisations, and the extent to which that is tailored for the needs of digital and, uh, and teaching. We found in our research that quite a few institutions have very tightly controlled technical infrastructures, which can often be a, an inhibitor or a barrier to digital innovation because uh, constraints uh, and guidelines from the IT department can often trump teaching and learning requirements uh, and necessities. So that's the institutional aspect. Uh, capability is all about having uh, tools available to staff to help them to use those tools and deploy them successfully at appropriate times. Uh, the staff have appropriate digital skills, uh, competence, confidence. And for us, we think it's really important that students are involved in this whole area policy and how these tools are used because at the end of the day the tools are used obviously for our students benefit and so it's not to involve them is we think uh, a serious uh, omission the last section of our, of our model is all about uh, well-being and lifelong learning so this future orientation uh, is all about how digital skills in the future will become uh, much more important this year the digital economy uh, and society index the, the DESI or DC uh, found that only 58% of, of people in, in Europe have basic uh, digital skills. And obviously, given those figures from the World Economic Forum, that's something we'd need to uh, develop uh, in the future. Lifelong learning is all about incul inculcating in people the desire to continue to learn, to develop uh, in the future. Uh, and the bottom of our list is the importance of, of well-being and, and thinking about how these tools are used and how you use as staff and students um, respond and how that needs to be an important part in how they are they are used. So to move on. So um, we <laughs> on. both did it at the same time there. <laughs> so quick question then for you. Um, so we think in our model, um, well being is a really important part of that. We're seeing it come into other models as well over the last few years, but would you agree? Uh, of the importance, the importance of well-being. So yes, I think we're seeing. Uh, thank you for those people who are. Yeah. Yes, okay. Okay, there's probably not a question then, in that case. Okay, uh, we'll we'll carry on as it's a a, a a complete yes. Yes, complete so yes. Thinking, okay, so. Here we what we then did, we, we said we have these different areas of um, importance looking at an organisational digital model. And we then thought about this uh, aspect of maturity. So maturity is a, is a measure, uh, uh, thank you, Deb, of, of how well organisations carry out their different uh, work. Normally, there are five levels or sometimes six, where level zero is you don't do it up to level five, where you're fantastic at it. And we can apply to our, our model. Uh, and this is a, a, a spider diagram representation of our nine components in those three areas. And how we see this being used potentially is that organizations could assess themselves uh, and benchmark themselves um, based on a set of criteria. And what they might come up with then will be this sort of representation 
So this is a view of a, a fictitious uh, HEI um, who scores highly on, say, staff digital uh, capabilities. So the staff are really good, uh, but they're quite low in terms of student involvement or the toolkit orientation. So this might help people to uh, have an objective view of where they are in their development and also suggest ways in which they might be able to uh, develop and expand their organization in the future. So this one might say, well, I want to involve students more or I want to uh, give more importance to well-being and therefore put a plan in place to, uh, to do that. So supporting uh, this model, we have these different levels uh, defined. So this is for well-being. So at level zero, there's nothing happening with well-being. We don't really take it into account. Where as we go through and get better, we get more mature at level five, staff student feedback drive digital learning. So um, everything we do is therefore driven by how students and staff respond to what it is that we're trying to do. That's just going to be our five levels. And so throughout those nine different dimensions, we're trying to define these different levels so that organizations can self-assess and also then for develop where they might go in the, uh, the future. Uh, so probably don't have time to debate uh, whether these maturity levels are uh, appropriate, uh, but your thoughts on this type of approach would be uh, very interesting uh, to hear and whether it would be useful to you in the future to have this form of uh, self-assessment tool available uh, would be interesting to, uh, to know. I think if I just chipped in there, because I'm aware that time's getting on and we're, we're, we're between everybody and lunch. What we did think was if anybody was really interested, the last slide is an invitation for anyone to get in touch with us. And we thought we could write a, a post-conference blog and put something up on the alt blog around it. So, um, you know, please do, please do uh, go and have a please do have a think about that. So I'll, I'll carry. Let me just carry on a little bit then. Oh. There we are. We're at the, we've got all of our references there. And just beyond that, Debbie, the next slide just gives a, a yeah. representation of our current thinking on the different levels uh, yeah. of, of this model that we're developing. So you, you get a full picture of what it is that we've, uh, we're thinking about. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's to be Bryant, it is also dinner time, supper time down under. International <laughs> audience here, of course, or breakfast, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> right, okay, let's just do the last couple of slides and then there'll be a minute or two for questions. So there's our second set of themes of our, of our model, which is colour coded. And then you can kind of see the third, the third set of themes. So, you know, we've, we're looking at this di digital maturity model. We're really, really interested in well-being. And if anybody's interested and wants to kind of send a couple of paragraphs through, get in touch with us and we can put things together. We've, we did um, an alt um, an old blog post kind of setting the scene for this and we'd be really we'd love to kind of pull different examples from different institutions together or just different people's thinking and to share that back with the community right okay questions and hopefully if anybody's got questions for Sarah are you still here Sarah we could we could just have a couple of minutes I am still here yes <laughs> perfect Thanks, thanks so much, um, Debbie and David, for that and a great, great bit of um, side chairing. I think you've done. <laughs> you didn't need me. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> you've done because we fabulous. love you, Deb. We love oh. you. <laughs> you've done a fabulous job. I sound so interested. Really, really interested mm. in all of that. Um, I've been trying to kind of look at the chat for you. Um, mm. There's been so many comments, which would be really nice for you to go back and have a look at. But I don't think any specific questions. Um, but if you know, we've got a couple of minutes. So if anybody wants me to make them, um, give them the the mic, then uh, please pop it in the chat or pop your hands up if you can, and I can do that. Oh, Richard's asking to share. Um, could you share your contact yeah. details with David and Debbie? Um, I'm just going to have another quick look. And just to say as well that the um, I did put it in the chat, but we are sharing um, the, the resources from all of the uh, summit are going up as soon as soon as we can get them up um, and they're available for anybody that's registered um, and then they will be made available openly in due course. I think that's a, a couple of weeks time. So um, I'm just double checking. Does anybody want the mic? Anybody? Any questions for either Debbie or David or indeed Sarah? 
Um, and there is, of course, two more sessions, I think. Yeah, in the green room and the bell room. We have a couple more sessions before the uh, official break at two o'clock. And I'll be back in the virtual cafe at two o'clock if anybody wants to join me for a chat. <laughs> Debbie and I met earlier on. It was great fun. We did, we did. It was really nice. Oh, thank you, Sarah. We really loved your session as well. Absolutely loved your images. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can go to town when you're not having to show data and stuff like that with uh, creative things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, right, okay. I'm going to stop the recording there then, guys. Um, I'm just going to uh, put the slide up so that we've got... And there we go. Excellent. That's great. Lovely. Thanks ever so much. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, thank you for two excellent sessions. Um, and the, the chat is still going along as we speak. Um, and I'm just going to stop the recording there because we've had a really, uh, really good couple of sessions. Thanks very much, everybody.